Hello and welcome to RJ Politics, Las Vegas Review Journal's weekly political podcast. I'm politics reporter Rory Appleton. I'm politics and government editor Steve Sebelius. And with us this week is 2020 Democratic presidential candidate Tom Steyer. Thanks so much for taking the time, Tom. It's great to be with you guys. Great, great. You seem to be doing quite well here. Why do you think that is? Uh, Rory, I'm different from everybody else who's running for president. I mean, if you look at the other people on the debate stage, I'm the only person who's an outsider. I'm the only person who for 10 years has been taking, putting together coalitions of American citizens to take on corporations and has been beating them. I'm running because I think the corporations own the government, but I have a 10 year history plus of actually taking them on and showing that I will fight them. I'm the only person who will say that climate's my number one priority, but that I'll do it from the standpoint of environmental justice the black and brown communities where you can't breathe without getting asthma, you can't drink the water that comes out of the tap without getting sick, but also that will create millions of millions of good paying union jobs as we solve the climate crisis. And lastly, we know Mr. Trump is running on the economy. He said so repeatedly, he th- claims to be good on the economy. I built a business over 30 years from scratch. I can take him on on the economy because he's a fake. And I have the experience and the expertise to show that he was a failed business person and a fake, and that he's a terrible steward of the American economy for the American people. He's a fake there too, and I can show it. And I'm different from everybody else because no one else has anything like that kind of experience. So why do you think that message has resonated here in, here in Nevada? I mean, that's, that's the, the message that you have for everybody. It's a message on the debate stage. It's a pretty consistent. Why do you think that, that Nevadans are responding well to you? Look, I think that on, I've been focused on the four early primary states, mm-hmm. including Nevada. And I've gone up in those states consistently, consistently so I got, since I got into this, ra- this race late in July. And so what we're seeing in Nevada, we're seeing in other places too. It's just there, been, you know, there hadn't been a poll in Nevada for months. And then when that poll came out that had me at 12% in third place, everyone was like, oh my goodness gracious, Tom's doing really well. And I was like, Actually, you haven't run a poll since November. You know, I've been seeing on the ground that this has been going on. I'm a grassroots organizer. We have a lot of people on the ground in Nevada contacting people and going door to door. And I've been here multiple times. I've been organizing through Next Gen America in Nevada since the beginning of 2014. So, you know, I'm seeing the same kind of momentum really pretty much across the four early primary states. You're doing small events. I, we, we're taping this right now at the Culinary Union where you just had a town hall, which I think is probably the biggest event I've seen you do here. You know, you're, you're talking to, to different small groups. And I just wanted to also talk about just really briefly that obviously earlier this week was a debate in Iowa. Pretty much every other candidate stayed in Iowa and you came back to Nevada. So, I mean, is that a priority for you? I mean, what, of what made is. you brought you back? Look, I, I, I am serious about Nevada. Just to, on a personal note, the first job I ever had was as a ranch hand outside Gardnerville, Nevada, where I got paid $100 a month for working six days a week from eight to five and milking two cows before breakfast and two cows after dinner. I've been coming to Nevada since I was a kid to work. I've been coming here for years to organize on the campuses, to go door to door personally, to register people. You know, I'm from the West Coast. I, you know, to me, coming to Nevada is like, you know, coming home. For everybody else, it's flying 3,000 miles. And, you know, they seem reluctant to do it. I have a completely different attitude. And so, yeah, I, you know, I met yesterday in Nevada with a national group of Native Americans. I think I was the only candidate who showed up in person. You were. I was there. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I wanted to say, you guys are important to me. You know, showing up says something. And I show up in Nevada because I care about Nevada. One of the reasons you said you weren't like anybody else running for president, one of the reasons that's true is some of your proposals uh, are are something no other presidential candidate in my lifetime has ever said. (laughs) Specifically, uh, the national referendums. Uh, uh, You and I have talked about that. I'm fascinated by that. Uh, you told me last time that the the uh, politicians in Washington are terrified 
of a national referendum. They're terrified of the voice of the American people uh, speaking out on a particular... And they're terrified of term limits, Steve. And term limits as well. They won't even use the word (laughs) term limits to say they're against them. But let me ask you this. uh, Specifically about the referendums, I'm a little bit unsettled on that myself uh, because, and maybe I've spent too much time on Twitter, but I've seen people who are out there. Are, Are you not concerned that the, that one of these referendums would produce something that many of us would disagree with or, or, or something that is bad policy? Look, it's possible that something would pass and we'd have to then unpass it. I understand that. But there's really a question you got to ask yourself. Who do you trust? Do you trust the politicians inside the Beltway more than you trust the American people? Let, we're starting from a, a position of broken government where the government literally isn't serving the American people or trying to, where it's been bought by corporations. So it's not like we're saying we have this perfect government that's you know, running along like a Swiss watch and everything's perfect, Tom. Why are you upsetting the apple cart? I'm saying we have a broken government and my answer is more democracy. It's more democracy at every level. My, if you look at what I've been doing, it's been to try to get more power to the American people, not to the elites inside Washington, D.C. And I'll give you an example, Steve. Need to impeach. You know what? Eight and a half million people, American citizens, signed a petition. They also called their Congress people. They emailed their Congress people. They wrote letters to their Congress people. They protested to say, hey, by the way, we have the most pro- corrupt president in American history. Do the right thing. Hold him to account. Everybody in Washington, D.C. was yelling at those eight and a half million people and me going, you're screwing everything up. Don't you realize this is bad politics? And we were saying, don't you understand that we're supposed to be a values driven, decent society where we make corrupt people obey the law? And that if you don't do that, you're giving up on the whole idea of the United States. So, so essentially what you're saying is that, you know, a national referendum governed direct democracy in America couldn't do any worse than what's already It'll being done. It'll do a done. million times better. Okay. Look, it's a high hurdle to get one of those things passed because everybody's worried about it. People only vote for those things. You know it's true here. Look, we got something done. I personally pushed in Nevada for... Question six, which was 50% clean energy by 2030. That should have gotten done in the legislature, and it subsequently got affirmed by the legislature and signed by the governor. But it couldn't get done because it wasn't – because the government wouldn't do it. It was a clearly good thing for Nevada. If we had a national referendum, we would have background checks on every gun purchase because everybody wants it. Why is it not happening? The answer is the gun manufacturers don't want it to happen. Even the NRA members want it to happen. But the gun manufacturers own the NRA, and they can't even get it brought up in the Senate of the United States. So there's really a question, Steve, of who do you think is going to fix this mess? Do you think it's been the people inside the Beltway? Are you going to trust them? Or are you going to actually think the American people with an outsider like me are actually going to push for what's right? I believe in the American people. I wanted to ask you about something that you talked about on the debate stage that I've seen you talk about on on stage with folks, you know, when there aren't cameras on. And it's and it's why you're running, but it's also you relate it to your family. You talk about having kids who've got, you know, bright, long lives ahead of them and having to, you know, uh, take action on climate change and these other things for them. Uh, One of the things I found interesting is you're obviously not the only one running who has a family, but in the very short amount of time. Your, your family has, has actively campaigned for you. I mean, you, your son has been here. Your, uh, I believe your wife was here last week. Uh, they'll I'm be sure here my daughter will get I think, here. Your da- I think your daughter moved to Iowa, We're if invading. I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and so it's, it's really become, in a very short amount of time, this like family campaign that I think is, is different than some of the other folks that you're running against who obviously you know, have families and are doing it for, for them as well. But you guys have become this, you know, you have surrogates who are your family, basically, and they're all around and, and everybody's working to get you elected. W- was that like a conscious decision or did that something just happen? Did they, did they decide themselves that they wanted to get involved with your campaign? Well, what, you know, what before, first of all, let me say, I have two kids who've quit their jobs or put their jobs on hold to work full-time on the campaign. And my wife has quit her job. She's actually put it, I hope she's put it on hold because <laughs> she's running a bank, a community bank that we started together um, to work full-time on the campaign. And I, we have two kids who are going to graduate school. 
one who in architecture school, one in medical school who have to go to class. Mm -hmm. But before I ever decided to do this, I got together and said, what do you guys think? I don't want, you know, this is something I think I need to do, but I want your opinion before I make a final decision. And they basically said, you got to take your stand. We want you to take this stand. We need you to take this stand and we want to take this stand with you. And that's what you're seeing on the campaign trail is their feeling. I say to them every time, I don't want, when they said they wanted to stop, stop their jobs and come, I was like, I don't, you guys don't need to do that. Don't do this for me. You know, I want you to lead your lives. And they're like, no, we want to take our stand. Well, uh, you, you're obviously uh, uh, a better businessman than I am. So <laughs> help me educate me on this, uh, on this question. Um, uh, you you are running. You have ads that say you're running against Trump on the economy. Trump is running on the economy. Obviously, uh, everywhere he goes, he says it's the greatest economy ever. Unemployment is low. Um, unemployment in minority communities lowest as it's ever been. All of those kind of things. Um, is the economy doing as well as we have been told, or is it, as you said, fake? Mr. Trump is a liar. Mr. Trump has always been a liar. Taking him at his word has always been a mistake. If the economy grows, but all of the increased income goes to the richest Americans, is that success? If you have low unemployment, which we do, but you can't afford to work on the jobs, you can't live on the jobs on your pay, is that success? And if the stock market goes up, but 85% of the stocks are owned by the top 10%, does that really mean, and, it's, and the stocks go up because the corporations aren't paying any taxes. Is that really success for America? He's doing this by cutting taxes to the richest Americans and the biggest corporations, and that's absolutely verifiable, running up a gigantic trillion-dollar deficit and saying that it's working when it isn't really working for Americans. And so he's a fake. He's always been a fake and a liar. He's a fake and a liar today. He'll go to his grave as a fake and a liar. I'm just trying to stand up for the American people. All right, great. Thank you so much for taking the time. As always, you can catch RJ Politics every Friday. It's a politics reporter, Rory Appleton. I'm politics and government editor, Steve Sebelius. Thank you so much. You guys, it's great to be with you.